All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here. Appreciate the fine folks at All Things Open putting together this great conference. Really enjoyed every time that I've uh, been a part of the conference in the past and looking forward to another great event today. So we are going to be talking about the new Security Onion 2. Um, but first, I want to kind of take a step back and I want to talk about the bicycle. You may ask yourself, why is he talking about bicycles? But trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. So I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about your first bicycle. You know, that might have been a little 12 inch bike with training wheels. It might have been a 20 inch BMX bike or free, freestyle bike. Um, but I want you to think about that feeling. You know, when you were a kid, you thought you could run really fast. But then when you learn to ride a bike, uh, all of a sudden you could you could ride with the wind. Uh, all of a sudden you could go much further and much faster than your little legs could take you previously. And then maybe at some point in the future, maybe you upgraded to a 10 speed bike or maybe a mountain bike with a whole lot more gears on it. And those gears helped you to climb hills and to be able to go even further and even faster than you could have previously. And so I want you to kind of think about uh, your experience as a bicycle rider. And uh, I'm going somewhere with that, I promise. So uh, the fine folks at Scientific American way back in 1973, they wrote this great article on the bicycle. And specifically, they talked about uh, this graph that you see here of the cost of transport, which is the, the calories per gram per kilometer, and comparing that to the body weight of certain animal species in kilograms. And so what you see here is that, you know, way up here at the top, you have mice, which have a really high cost of transport. It's really expensive for them to move themselves around, even though mice are actually pretty small. And if, as you go further down this graph, you get into things like dogs. Dogs are pretty efficient. Sheep are even more efficient. And then you get into mankind. We're more efficient than sheep or dogs. We're doing okay. But yet, you know, horses still beat us out pretty good. And salmon, look how efficient salmon is, uh, you know, compared to their body weight. But the point of this chart is not really this stuff up here so much, more specifically down here, man on bicycle. And if you look at that, that what that's telling you is that man on bicycle is incredibly efficient. So man as a tool builder was able to build this tool, which was lightweight and efficient and helped us to go further and faster than we could have otherwise uh, and even compared to things like jet transport and automobiles and fighter planes and things like that, the bicycle is incredibly efficient. So I think this is a really great analogy. And uh, this other guy thought it was a great analogy too. And his name was Steve Jobs. And years ago, he co-founded a company called Apple. You may have heard of it. And uh, he had this great quote way back in 1980 when he said, when we invented the personal computer, we created a new kind of bicycle, a new man-machine partnership. And I think that's a great quote. And they used that quote uh, to great success in a marketing campaign where they said that Apple computer is really kind of a bicycle for the mind. Now, instead of a bicycle really kind of helping your legs, you've got a bicycle that's helping that muscle that's inside of our head. Uh, so we can take an idea that's in our brain and we can use this sort of technological bicycle to take that idea even further, even faster than we could before. And so they had this great marketing campaign that showed a guy on a bicycle with kind of an Apple computer on the back, a bicycle for the mind. So I think that's a great kind of mental image for, you know, what we're trying to do in the computer industry and, and specifically, you know, what we're trying to do in the cybersecurity industry. And so that logo actually kind of reminds me of this logo, which is our brand new logo for Security Onion Solutions. 
Uh, so it kind of looks like a bike, you know, this, these concentric circles kind of look like you pedaling those pedals around and around and around. And of course, this, this O in the middle is really kind of symbolizing an onion, which is uh, where the, the free and open source platform originally started, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the idea is that we want to peel back the layers of our enterprises and make our adversaries cry. And uh, there's lots of other subtle Easter eggs hidden in this new logo design. Uh, one of them is kind of the, the stem of the onion is blue for blue teamers. We're, we're defenders. We're defending against those red teamers, those adversaries that are trying to break into our networks. And then in addition to this being an onion, you know, if you look closely, including the stem, this also kind of makes out an S. So you kind of, kind of got an S overlaid on top of the O. So there's lots of little details that we packed into this new logo design, which is really sort of just a, a glimmer of an idea of how much detail and how much thought we've put into our new software platform, which is what we're going to talk about today. So that's our new kind of company logo. We also have a new logo for the free and open source software, which you'll see in just a few minutes. Uh, and, you know, we we'll talk about those logos as we as we go on. So a brief history of Security Onion way back in 2008, I started building Security Onion because I really saw this problem. First and foremost, you know, back in 2008, uh, we as defenders were getting our butts kicked by adversaries. Uh, we were outmanned and outgunned and, and we had every single disadvantage there was in terms of, of trying to keep our networks secure. And one of the many kind of disadvantages that we had was that, you know, back then there was this toolkit called Backtrack Linux, which is now called Kali Linux. And that was kind of the attacker's tool set already compiled, already configured, ready to go. And attackers could freely download that and be up and running in just a few minutes with all their favorite tools. But yet we as defenders didn't really have anything like that. We had some individual open source components, but no real overarching platform that put those components together in a coherent fashion. And this really kind of hit home for me uh, in about 2009, 2010, I was actually working a pretty major security incident. And I realized very early on in the investigation that the attacker was actually using Backtrack Linux. And so, you know, here I was, I was trying to uh, string together some open source components and I had a few commercial security appliances and I was doing the best that I could, but still at the end of the day, uh, it was so much easier for that bad guy to break into my network than it was for me to try to monitor my own network and defend against those adversaries that's kind of fundamentally unjust. And so it became clear to me that, you know, it was kind of my mission in life to try to rebalance that equation, to try to give defenders a few more advantages over the adversaries. So that was the idea that really kind of started off in 2008. Uh, it took several months to build that first version to identify the, the proper open source components and to kind of glue them together and make it easy to use. And so that first version came out in 2009. And over the years, we continued to make improvements to Security Onion as a free and open source platform. Uh, and the, the worldwide Security Onion community grew and really kind of took off. Uh, we're now over 1 million downloads. Our software is being used in uh, just about every corner of the globe that there is by defenders who you know, are, are trying their best to defend their networks and are, are coming to rely on Security Onion to do that. In 2014, uh, I really kind of made this my full-time job. So I previously I had a, a great job working for Mandiant, which then got acquired by FireEye. Uh, but I, I knew that Security Onion was uh, really kind of needing some full-time attention. Uh, all of these folks that were using it all around the world were asking for things like training and professional services and hardware appliances. So in 2014, I started Security Onion Solutions as the company behind that free and open source platform. And we've been steadily growing as a company ever since then. 
And so the, the next big kind of turning point in our history was in 2018. Uh, and this was really kind of the 10 the year anniversary of the Security Onion project. And it made sense to say, okay, what are we gonna do for the next 10 years? What is the, the next generation platform look like? So I hired a product manager, Mike Reeves, and the very first conversation that we had was about Security Onion 2. What's it actually going to look like? Uh, what are the things that we need to change about the existing Security Onion platform to make it stronger, faster, more capable, more scalable, and to make it that much better of a bicycle to enable defenders to defend themselves? So we started that discussion in 2018, started building that new platform that year, and in 2019, we, because we believe in release early, release often, that's a kind of a common mantra that you hear in open source projects, uh, we released the first alpha version of Security Onion 2 because it's important to us to make sure that we're putting things out there, uh, getting folks to poke it and prod it and give us feedback so that we can then incorporate that feedback into future iterations of the project. So we did that in 2019. And then this year, 2020, we reached the release candidate phase. So in 2020, we released RC1, RC2, and RC3. And so this slide says, you know, a brief history of Security Onion, but I'd actually, actually like to change that slide. And uh, we made history on this past Friday because we actually released Security Onion 2 at our annual Security Onion conference. Uh, we made the big announcement that Security Onion 2 is now generally available. And so, you know, if you look at that, that's uh, really kind of three years of blood, sweat, and tears that went into this particular platform that all culminated in that release announcement last Friday. And so we're, we're happy to uh, talk about that here today and kind of introduce it to uh, another new audience here. So let's kind of talk about some of the challenges of this new Security Onion 2 platform. So first and foremost, you know, we want folks to be able to easily download Security Onion and spin it up maybe in a virtual machine and get their feet wet just very quickly and easily without, without too much fighting with the platform, uh, just make it nice and streamlined. Maybe that's trying it out as a practitioner. Maybe that's, you know, you're a student and you're using it for a college cybersecurity class, whatever the case may be. We want you to be able to have a, a really good first experience with Security Onion. And that's really easy uh, because, you know, if you're talking about running these kind of components in a small virtual machine, scalability is not an issue at that point in time. So that's pretty easy. We've been able to do that for uh, ever since the beginning of the Security Onion project way back in 2008. But what's more difficult is really that second bullet point, which is how do you build a platform that's scalable so that if you are trying to defend an enterprise with offices around the world and you might need to have network sensors at each of those offices. So now we're talking about thousands of sensors and maybe 10,000 devices that you're monitoring on that enterprise network. Well, going to that opposite end of the spectrum is hard. It's more difficult than that first use case of a small virtual machine. Now, what's also hard is how do you, especially for that enterprise setting, you know, those enterprise users want to be able to customize that deployment. They want to be able to integrate it with other systems in their enterprise. But at the same time, we want to keep them from shooting themselves in the foot, right? So how do you how do you walk that delicate line that what's the delicate balancing act between allowing customization, but preventing folks from breaking the system. And then the next challenge that we had was we have a lot of military customers. A lot of folks uh, are monitoring military networks using our software. And a lot of those military networks are air gapped. They don't have internet access. And so how do, you, how do you do all of these things that we talked about above without 
internet access and how do you update that platform? So when we come out with a new version, how do you actually get those updates across that air gap in a secure fashion? And then finally, how do you do all of this in the easiest way possible, which is either using our ISO image, or if you don't want to use our ISO image, simply running a, a very simple bash script. Uh, and that's where kind of all these challenges come together. It's really kind of, uh, you know, adding all these things together, each of them has their own complexity, but when you try to put it all together and make it simple, uh, that's an even higher level of complexity. So let's look at the numbers. Uh, kind of talked before about the history of Security Onion 2. We started talking about it in 2018. We started off with some tech preview releases, just so folks could kind of see what it looks like. Uh, but we made lots of disclaimers at the time of, you know, things are going to change drastically, but we want to release early, release often. We want you to poke at it, prod at it, and give us your feedback so we can incorporate that feedback. So then we then moved into the alpha phase. We did four of those alpha releases. We moved into beta phase. We did beta one, beta two, beta three. And as I mentioned previously, we did RC1, RC2, and RC3. So you can see here, we did lots of releases along the way. Again, trying to solicit that feedback from the community so that we could bring that feedback in as early on as possible in the development life cycle and make sure that when we do finally reach the release date, that uh, things are gonna be in as good shape as possible. So when you look at that entire history of Security Onion 2, you're talking about over 34 months of development work. If you look at our GitHub repo, it's over 5,000 commits. Uh, so this is a massive undertaking uh, and you know we're, we're very proud to have it behind us to be able to kind of put the bow on it and put it out there and release it to the community. Uh, we're, we're really excited to have it out there after doing all of that work. So after talking about the history of this new Security Onion 2 platform, uh, you know, now your next question is, okay, well, how do I install Security Onion? Your first option is you can download our Security Onion 2 ISO image. So assuming that you've uh, done an installation of, of any modern Linux distribution before, this is gonna be pretty simple for you. Our ISO image is based on CentOS 7. And so if you're familiar with that, uh, it's gonna be very much identical, although it's actually gonna be a little bit easier because we've got an automated installation. And so basically all you do is uh, give it a username, you set your password and confirm your password, and it does all of the partitioning for you automatically and uh, gets the system set up very quickly and very easily. Now, if you don't want to use our ISO image, that's fine too. You can install standard CentOS 7, or you can install Ubuntu 18.04 and then run our installer on top of either one of those. And that's what I mentioned before about how do you do all of those complex challenges while still making this easy to install via a simple shell script. And that's how that works. If, you're to, if you were to install on top of CentOS 7 or Ubuntu 18.04, you'd just be running a shell script from our GitHub repo and it would download all the components and install them appropriately. Now, how do we actually accomplish that? Uh, because if you're familiar with Linux distributions, uh, you know that there's not really a, a, a simple trivial way to uh, really kind of deal with both CentOS 7 and Ubuntu 18.04 at the same time. Uh, of course, nowadays we have Docker containers and that's exactly what this new platform is based on. So we've containerized the entire platform. All of our major components have their own Docker containers. And that's what enables us to embrace not just Ubuntu as we had in the past with the original version of Security Onion, but also CentOS and in the future, potentially other Linux distributions as well. And that's really kind of the brilliant thing about containers is it's this nice abstraction layer, which makes it easy to run on different Linux distributions. In addition to that, that also means that we get some nice 
security side benefits because those containers have a little bit stronger isolation from each other and from the host operating system than you would normally have with a traditional RPM package or, or traditional Ubuntu Debian package. Uh, so we get some nice security benefits from that containerization. Now, those containers are actually orchestrated using SaltStack, and that's kind of the other piece of the puzzle in terms of how are we able to run on both CentOS 7 and Ubuntu 18.04. So we've developed a comprehensive set of SaltStack scripts, which then orchestrate all of those dark Docker containers, and they make sure that they're running properly, they make sure that they're configured properly, and that kind of gets back to the, the key point that we talked about a few slides ago about how do we enable users to customize the software, but at the same time prevent them from breaking the system. And that's exactly what SaltStack allows us to do because you can go into the configuration and you can configure things how you want them. And then SaltStack is going to make sure that they're always in the proper state. And so that's that enables you to have a much more reliable system that's much more likely to be in the proper configuration the way that you want it to be. So your next question is, okay, well, how do I make my adversaries cry with Security Onion? Well, this is what that looks like. We've got kind of an architecture diagram here and we can see at the top that adversary out on the big bad internet. And we've got our firewall here, which uh, kind of separates us from that wild, wild west of the internet. And so what we'd like to do is install Security Onion on your network and have it collect network traffic from a tap or a span port. And we call this kind of the, the north-south traffic because that's the traffic that's kind of leaving your network and going out to the internet. And that's really kind of the, the best place to start your network monitoring. And then once you kind of have uh, some good visibility there, the next thing you wanna do is, is get some east-west visibility. What do we mean by that? Well, that means is, you know, probably on your enterprise network, you, you probably have some core switches that have your kind of data center connected to it. You might have some edge switches, which might have your desktops and laptops and other endpoints connected there. And really what you're looking for is when an adversary gets into your environment and establishes a foothold, maybe on one of these endpoints down here, maybe that's via a spear phishing email or some other uh, initial compromise. The next thing they're going to do is try to pivot laterally from that endpoint to some of the systems in your data centers. They're probably gonna to try to go after Active Directory. They're probably gonna to try to go after your file servers, your database servers. And that's gonna be that lateral movement that we're looking for. So ideally, we like to monitor our north-south traffic from a tap or span port here, just inside the firewall. And we'd like to monitor our east-west traffic from a tap or span port on the inside of our network. Now that network visibility is a great place to start. Uh, but as we all know, more and more of our network traffic is becoming encrypted. And that's generally a good thing in terms of privacy. However, for us as defenders, that makes our jobs a little bit more difficult. And so that means we've kind of got some blind spots in our network visibility. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to fill in those blind spots with some additional visibility from host logs. And so that's what you see in the bottom part of this diagram. We want to be able to collect logs from your servers. We want to be able to collect endpoint logs from your laptops and desktops and workstations and really bring all of that data back to Security Onion so that I can see both the network visibility and the host visibility and I can correlate between the two and I can very quickly and easily slice and dice all that data, find those adversaries that are hiding out in my network and hopefully interrupt them before they achieve their objectives. If we can do that, then we can make our adversaries cry because we've frustrated them. Uh, we've, we've kind of taught them a lesson. We've slapped their hand uh, and hopefully they, they will learn their lesson and not come back to our network because they know that we're gonna catch them if they try to get back in. So that's really the ideal. That's what we wanna try to get to. 
let's talk about that network visibility piece first. Uh, as I mentioned before, Security Onion is kind of based on the best of breed open source components uh, that, that already existed out there. You know, it, it didn't make sense for us to go and reinvent the wheel. Rather, we wanted to kind of integrate with all of these existing open source projects that were out there and their own open source communities and really use those, those best of breed integrations and, and really take that to the next level and build the best of breed open source platform that has all those components. So the first thing that we do is, is we start with network-based IDS alerts and we get those from a component called Suricata. Suricata has been around for many, many years now and uh, it does a great job of monitoring your network traffic, running a rule set. Uh, and, and for example, we give you the emerging threats open rule set by default, that's a totally free rule set, over 20,000 rules. As Suricata is monitoring your traffic, if any of that traffic matches any one of those rules, then Suricata will generate an alert. And that's really kind of a starting point for your investigative process. Now I say that's a starting point because anybody who's ever looked at an IDS alert before, you realize of course that an IDS alert really kind of poses a question, but it doesn't necessarily answer that question in and of itself. Uh, in other words, it's important for us as defenders, as analysts, to be able to kind of surround that IDS alert with other contextual data that helps us determine, is that IDS alert, number one, a true positive or a false positive? And number two, if it's a true positive, does it even have any impact for our environment? Uh, meaning that it could be a true positive for a piece of software that we don't even run in our enterprise. And so even if it is a true positive, I don't care because I'm not vulnerable since I'm not running that software. So that's kind of where we start, but then we, we need that context and we get that context from protocol metadata. What does that mean? Well, we have processes, uh, either Zeek or Suricata, that are going to monitor that network traffic and they're going to log every single HTTP transaction, meaning every time you go to a website, it's going to create a log and say, this IP address went out to google.com and requested this page. Now, of course, google.com by default nowadays is encrypted, so it's going to be HTTPS. So our visibility is somewhat limited there. However, uh, we still get protocol metadata from those HTTPS connections because those SSL certificates, those TLS certificates, have to be exchanged in clear text. And we're still getting logging from those certificates because they're being transferred in clear text across the network. In addition to HTTP and HTTPS, we also have a log of all DNS lookups. We have a log of all connections, regardless of protocol. And that really kind of gives you that next level of data to help you start to paint a more complete picture around those IDS alerts. And then if that's not enough context, we also do full packet capture. And this is really like a video camera for your network uh, because you know I, I like to use the analogy of a security system for your house. Uh, you know, if, if you want physical security for your house, you go and get a security system, but if you, if you ha had the installer come out and you realized that what they installed was just a motion activated camera that took a snapshot, uh, well, that's kind of what our network-based IDS alerts are. It's really just kind of a snapshot in time. What we'd really prefer to have is a videotape that we can rewind and see exactly what happened from start to finish. And that's what our full packet capture does for us. We get that from Google Stenographer. So it's designed by Google. It's designed to run on very large networks with lots of uh, bandwidth. And so it's very scalable by design. And so we've integrated that right into Security Onion version two so that you can very quickly and easily go from a network-based IDS alert. You can surround that with your protocol metadata. And then if you find an interesting TCP connection uh, that Maybe it's uh, a command and control beacon. Maybe it's data exfiltration, uh, information being stolen from your network. You can then pivot to full packet capture 
to actually see the nitty gritty details. You can then rewind that videotape and see exactly what that bad guy did in your network. So here's what that looks like from a component standpoint. Traffic comes into our sniffing network interface. And then we use AF packet, which is built into modern Linux kernels. We use that as a flow-based load balancer so that we can then spin up multiple workers for things like Stenographer and Sericata and Zeek so that they can scale up to handle high amounts of traffic. And so these scalable processes are really only limited by the number of CPU cores that you have in your sensor. So, you know, if you, you buy a fancy new server with AMD Epic processors with 128 CPU cores, then you'll be able to spin up lots and lots of these worker processes and be able to handle lots and lots of network traffic. So we have Stenographer that's writing that full packet capture out to slash NSM slash PCAP. We have Suricata that's writing our IDS alerts out to NSM Suricata. We have Zeek that's writing out our protocol metadata to NSM slash Zeek slash logs. And it's also detecting well-known file types, things like Windows executables and PDF files, things that are commonly seen in malware attacks. And it's automatically extracting those files to this location, NSM Zeek extracted complete. And then we have another process that comes along called Strelka, which does automated file analysis on those extracted file types. So that's another great way to really kind of look for malware that's being transferred across your network. Now, as we talked about before, more and more of our network traffic is becoming encrypted. And so it's important for us to kind of augment our network visibility with endpoint visibility as well. We've got a couple of options for that. And the first is OS Query. OS Query is a great cross-platform endpoint agent uh, being cross-platform, it can run on Windows, Mac OS, Unix, Linux, what have you. And uh, the great thing about OS Query is that we also have a nice web interface for managing those OS Query agents. So if you deploy OS Query agents to your enterprise, they'll check into your security on your deployment. You can log into Fleet, and that's your web interface for managing those agents. You can then go and query those agents uh, interactively. So I can target a specific set of agents. I can run queries against them. I can interrogate their memory, their disk, their registry, whatever the case may be. And so that's a really great free and open source cross-platform agent for endpoint visibility. Another option is the Elastic Beats family of agents. Of course, Security Onion includes the Elastic Stack, and that's how we store all of our logs. Uh, and because of that, we can integrate quite nicely with the Beats family of endpoint agents. So, for example, for Windows, you can download WinLogBeat and install that on your Windows endpoint. It's going to collect all of those standard Windows system logs and send those over to the Elastic Stack on Security Onion. And that's where you can slice and dice all of those logs. Another option is Wazoo, which is kind of the next generation fork of an older uh, component called OSEC, which is a host-based intrusion detection system. And the nice thing about OSEC and now Wazoo is that it's not just log collection, but it's encrypted log transport, it's file integrity checking, it's rootkit detection. So you really kind of get multiple components in one nice, neat little agent. So we've got really kind of three big options here. Uh, and it's really kind of up to you in terms of what's the best for your enterprise. Do you need something that's cross-platform? Do you need something that fits a certain uh, set of features? Uh, and so, you know, in some cases, enterprises already have one of these that they're already using. And so that's why we want to be able to integrate with as many different endpoint agents as possible to kind of meet enterprise users where they are and be able to integrate with their existing technologies where possible. And so uh, those are really the three best of breed open source endpoint agents that are available uh, for integration today. Now, in addition to that, uh, there are some other kind of um, 
additional add-ons that can give you additional visibility. So for example, especially in the world of Windows, you know, we, even if we are free and open source advocates, chances are in our networks, we have some, some Windows installations somewhere. Uh, and for those Windows deployments, Sysmon is a great free utility. It's not open source, of course, but it is free from the SysInternals team at Microsoft. And it gives us really comprehensive logging for those Windows endpoints. So it logs things like network connections and process creation and registry changes, all kinds of great telemetry for those Windows endpoints. And the great thing is that as Sysmon is logging that stuff, that log can be picked up by any one of these three endpoint agents up here. So these really kind of fit together quite nicely. Uh, and in addition to that, we have auto runs as well. It's another tool from the SysInternals tool set. And auto runs shows you those auto run locations inside of Windows that attackers might be using as a form of persistence, as a persistence mechanism to maintain that foothold in your environment. So you could deploy auto runs, you could have it logging and be collecting those auto runs logs back to Security Onion where you could slice and dice and look for those persistence mechanisms across your entire enterprise. Now, once you have your network visibility and your host-based visibility as well, you're now ready to log into Security Onion 2. When you do so, you'll be gre greeted with our new Security Onion console or SOC as we call it. And so if you log in here with your email address and password, you're then logged into SOC and that gives you access to really all of these really nice web interfaces, which really integrate quite nicely. And we'll kind of talk about how these things fit together over the next few slides. So there are a, a few native tools built into Security Onion Console and that's things like Hunt and PCAP uh, but SOC also gives you access to some external tools, things like Kibana, Grafana, Fleet, The Hive, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about some of the tools that are built into Security Onion Console natively. So when you log into SOC, you'll be greeted with this menu on the left-hand side. You've got the overview. And the next thing you have is alerts. And this is a brand new interface that we just developed. So even if you were following along with some of our release candidates for Security Onion 2, you wouldn't have even seen this in any of the release candidates because it's brand new, it's fresh out of the oven, and we're really excited about it because we really set out to build uh, what is the simplest interface possible for dealing with alerts, whether they're network-based IDS alerts or host-based alerts or uh, Strelka alerts or playbook alerts, and to be able to do that in a scalable fashion. Because if, if we plug in any kind of a sensor to an enterprise network, doesn't matter whether it's Security Onion or something else, any network sensor is going to start generating hundreds or thousands or potentially 10,000 or more alerts. And we need to be able to slice and dice those alerts very quickly and easily. So we put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into this new alerts interface to make sure that it was gonna be as simple to use as possible, but at the same time be extremely scalable for those large enterprise deployments. Uh, so the nice thing about this alerts interface is that uh, you can deal with large numbers of alerts uh, and it's, a, it's an alerts queue, which is an, an important concept because you know, these alerts are high priority events. And when it comes to defenders, whether you have an official security, uh, a security operations center or not, uh, you need to be working through that queue every single day. We want to work that queue down to zero every single day if possible. And so it's important to think about this queue and to go in here and you know, use these icons on the left to either acknowledge an alert to say this is either a false positive or maybe it's a true positive, but I just don't care about it. But on the other hand, if it is a true positive and I do care about it, and maybe it's time to engage the incident response process, 
that's when I would use this blue triangle to escalate that particular alert. And so the beauty of this is that regardless of whether, you know, maybe you're the only defender in your enterprise, that's kind of one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is a, a, a really large mature organization that has a large security operations center with multiple tiers of analysts. Maybe you have some level one analysts that do the initial triage, they escalate things up to higher level analysts. Uh, this interface really kind of caters to both of those ends of the spectrum and everything in between, and it scales quite nicely. So we're really proud of this new alerts interface. Now, moving from there, you know, I talked before about how IDS alerts in particular start an investigation. They may kind of pose a question, but it's really kind of up to us as analysts or defenders to answer that question. And that's where we need to cast a wider net and look for additional context around those alerts so that we can then paint a more complete picture about what actually happened. And so we make it very easy for you to pivot from that alerts interface in the previous slide to what we're calling the hunt interface, which really gives you access to not just alerts, but really all of our data types. All of that protocol metadata, all of your host logs, all of your endpoint logs. Uh, if you send firewall logs to it, all of those are gonna show up in there. And so that's really going to allow you to ask the question, well, this IP address looks like it might potentially be compromised. So what else has it done in the last 24 hours? Has it connected out to any strange IP addresses on the internet? Has it tried to do any uh, lateral movement on the inside of the network? And that's what Hunt is going to enable you to do when you are investigating those alerts. Now, even apart from alert investigation, the brilliant thing about threat hunting is that you know, we need to be able to go in and really kind of look at all of our data at a glance and group it by different fields, uh, slice it and dice it across multiple dimensions, looking for those anomalies or those outliers, which might be indicative of suspicious or possibly malicious activity. So Hunt is really and truly designed from the ground up to be able to do all of that very quickly and easily. Now, the next thing that we talked about was full packet capture. And so we designed a web interface specifically for that, which gives you a, a nice overview of full packet capture when you're looking at a particular stream. You can also switch to an ASCII transcript view, which you see on the right-hand side here. And you can also download the PCAP itself if you want to open it up in Wireshark or Network Miner or some other libpcap utility. Now, if you're familiar with the Elastic Stack, we also include Kibana. And so we've built dashboards for all of our main data types. So you can go in there into Kibana, you can look at all those dashboards. We also enable you to escalate events from Kibana and create cases out of those. We enable you to pivot to full packet capture from Kibana. So it's really a, a comprehensive uh, kind of integration that we've done between all these different tools and all these different data types. Now, once you've found an interesting bit of traffic, you might have some encoding, you might have uh, some sort of decoding that you need to do in order to analyze that. And that's where CyberChef comes into play. CyberChef has lots of great plugins for being able to decode different strings and different blobs and different kinds of data uh, and really excels at that. And we'll actually see an example of that in our demo a little bit later. We've also got a, a new interface called Playbook. Uh, and the idea here is that Playbook can pull in Sigma rules, which enable you to define uh, suspicious uh, indicators of compromise really across your entire enterprise, whether that's from a network perspective or a host-based perspective. And you can then go in and write plays to detect that kind of activity in the future and then schedule those uh, queries to run on a periodic basis and generate alerts as necessary. Next, we have Fleet, which I mentioned before is the web interface for OS Query. So as you deploy OS Query agents to your enterprise, they'll check into this web interface and you can then query those endpoints 
You can interrogate them, ask them questions, and get answers back really quickly and easily. Next, we have the Hive, and that's kind of our case management software. So as we escalate events from alerts or hunt or Kibana, they create cases in the Hive. And then you and your fellow analysts and defenders can then work together to work through those cases, document all of your indicators, document all of your actions, and then ultimately close those cases. Next, we have the attack navigator from the fine folks at MITRE. This goes along with their MITRE attack framework, and it gives you kind of uh, visibility over how much coverage you have for that attack framework. So again, think about how this might fit into your overall incident response process or your, your kind of security visibility over your enterprise. Hey, Doug, I see we have about 15 minutes left, so I just want to make sure you're still good on time. Yes. Um, we do have two questions in the chat if you're, you're able to answer them at this time. Okay, sure. Yeah, so the first one is, is it possible to dual boot with SOV2? And if you would, um, you recommend to either use SOV2 ISO image or install it over CentOS 7 Ubuntu 18.04, or do you recommend another option? That's a really good question. Actually, there's a few questions there. So I'll start with the first one, which was uh, about dual booting. So in theory, you could dual boot, uh, but in practice, you probably wouldn't want to. Uh, and I I'll tell you why. Um, in addition to announcing Security Onion 2 on Friday, last Friday, we also announced an end of life, a six month end of life window for Security Onion 1604. What that means is that because Security Onion 1604 is based on Ubuntu 1604, and because Ubuntu 1604 goes end of life in April of 2021, that therefore means that Security Onion 1604 goes end of life April 2021 as well. So what we're telling folks is you should go ahead and start planning today to either upgrade or replace any existing Security Onion 1604 deployments with Security Onion 2. And there's so many new features and so many new capabilities in Security Onion 2, it's gonna be well worth your time and effort to do that upgrade or replace uh, and, and get that new capability and that new feature set from Security Onion 2. Uh, in terms of what we recommend, for most folks, we recommend using our Security Onion 2 ISO image because it's the quickest and easiest way to get it installed and configured. If you don't wanna use that, you don't have to, you can install our components manually on CentOS 7 or Ubuntu 18.04, but for most folks, we recommend using our ISO image. Okay, great answer. Our next question comes from Paul. Have you, have you seen benefits or have implementation insights in relation to process scaling through container-based deployment? Yeah, I think that's a great question too. And, and we've definitely seen lots of benefits of containerization. Uh, we started with containers a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was 2017 when we decided to embrace the Elastic Stack. And since we were running on Ubuntu 16.04 at the time, we really needed to containerize the Elastic Stack and so that we could run the latest version of the Elastic Stack. And so there was certainly a learning curve there, having been used to the world of Ubuntu packages for many, many years, it was definitely a transition period to kind of migrate from Ubuntu packages to containers. But having done that and having gotten over that learning curve, it was certainly well worth it for all of the additional capabilities that you get, uh, things like, you know, that nice abstraction layer so that we can run on more than one Linux distribution. We can now support not just Ubuntu, but also CentOS. We also get security side benefits. So we get some additional isolation between those processes and between the processes and the host operating, operating system itself. And then furthermore, if you think about from the standpoint that you know, if a, if a user were to mess up a container or even worse, if an attacker were to get into the system and mess up a container, it's really easy then, trivial, 
to kind of restart that process, which essentially wipes out that container and initiates a new container from a known good image. So at that point, you're really talking about a really stable, reliable system, uh, which is going to be really kind of bulletproof for the future. Can you not run Security Onion in CentOS 8? Ah, that's a really great question. When CentOS 8 was announced, uh, we took a, a really good look at that because we, we want to be able to embrace that and integrate with it as soon as possible. The fine folks at Red Hat uh, made a change in, where they're no longer supporting Docker. They're instead supporting Podman, which is kind of their own Docker replacement. And they're currently working on making the Podman API compatible with the Docker API. Once that happens, then we should be able to support CentOS 8. Uh, but it all comes down to getting that API being fully compatible. Fair enough. Okay. So those are the questions we've had so far. I know we have about nine minutes left. Doug, I'm going to leave this to you. Um, you can continue presenting or we can take a short break and pick back up at the top of the hour. Why don't we take a short break and we'll, we'll pick up at the top of the hour and we'll finish up the slides and then we'll move into the, uh, the live demo. It's a great session. Thank you. I just like how you tie it all together from the company's name, Steve Jobs, Bike for Mind and the company logo. It was just a great story. Appreciate that. It's uh... You know, it's, it's important to, to do some storytelling and to be able to, uh, you know, not just be a, the total nerd that I am, but be able to, you know, connect with folks and tell stories and, and tie these things together into something that's a little bit more meaningful than just bits and bytes. Yeah, no, I definitely loved it, though. For that type of stuff, it, it like makes sense to me. I'm not a technical person. So when people give a story like that, I'm like, I'm on board with this now. <laughs> Nice. I didn't realize they must have like kicked us out or something like not sharing. Um, huh. So I do see one more question here. Um, there are ways to run Docker in Cent, CentOS 08. If you want, I can provide the info. What, it's not a question, it was a statement that came in, yeah. Yeah, uh, we are aware that there are ways to run Docker. Uh, part of the problem is that we're, we're not just trying to run Docker itself, we're also trying to use SaltStack to orchestrate those Docker containers. So it's it all comes down to Red Hat making the Podman API 100% compatible with the Docker API, and then SaltStack making sure that uh, their SaltStack components for instantiating Docker containers can actually instantiate those Podman containers. So there is a way forward. It is going to happen at some point in time. It's just kind of a waiting game at this point. Okay, there's one more. With Security Onion version two, is it possible to generate contact notifications when service or host problems occur so they can get resolved via email, pager, or user defined method in case someone is currently away from their desk versus currently sitting and watching the alerts? Yes, that's a really good question. We have a process called a last alert, and the idea is that it's going to uh, based on your predefined criteria, it's going to search across all of the data that's in Elasticsearch. And if anything matches your specific criteria, whether it's an alert or, or anything else, then Elastalert can then take an action on that. And that could be sending an email, it could be uh, integrating with Slack and sending a message via Slack or some other kind of a chat client. So yeah, there's lots of different ways of doing that. I think people like being able to have those options too for variety because there's so many different use cases and people operate so differently. So it's good to have that flexibility. Absolutely. Back, 
Yeah, I see we're back at the top of the hour. So everybody, welcome back to All Things Open. My name's Katie Grigg. I'm here on the Security Talk Track. And I have the pleasure of introducing Doug Burks again from Security Onion. So here we'll be doing the second part of his workshop today. I know he's got a couple more slides and then the moment we've all been waiting for is the live demo. So Doug, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much. Let me uh, share my screen again. And I think that should be the right one. Can you confirm you can see that okay? Looks good. All right. So when we uh, left off, we were kind of talking about some of the different interfaces that we include in Security Onion 2. And the next one on the list is Grafana. And that's really where we're going to log in to see the how our system is doing health-wise. And so we can see things like CPU usage, disk usage, do we have any packet loss? And we can see this historically. So by default, it's gonna show you for the last hour, but you could change that to the last 24 hours, the last week, whatever. And so you could chart these things over time and you can see exactly, you know, did we have a blip here? Did we have a service outage here? Uh, and that kind of ties into one of the questions before about, you know, if there's a, a process problem or some other kind of an outage, can we be alerted to that? And Grafana can help you to track that stuff down to determine, you know, look at your, your graphs and, and look for those blips and look for those peaks and valleys. In addition to that, uh, we've done a lot of work for Grafana to make it really kind of integrate with our distributed deployment model, which we'll talk about in just a minute, so that you can, from, the, from a single pane of glass, you can essentially see the health metrics from across your entire security onion deployment. So you may have a single standalone box, or you may have 10 or 100 security onion boxes in one kind of grid, but Grafana is going to show you the health of all of those. All right, so next up, we have what we call the analyst workstation. And this is kind of an optional thing that we have built into Security Onion 2. And the idea here is that, you know, if you're going to look at potentially malicious traffic, and especially if you're going to be looking at suspected malware, maybe you're going to kind of reconstruct that malware and uh, maybe try to do some reverse engineering on it. Well, then uh, the scary thing is we don't want to do that in kind of our corporate Windows image where if we accidentally execute that malware, our day has just gone from bad to worse. So it's important to do that in a relatively safe environment. And that's exactly what we've built with the Analyst Workstation. So if you install Security Onion 2 and you optionally install the Analyst Workstation, you're going to get a full GNOME desktop, the Chromium web browser. You're going to get some PCAP utilities, including Network Miner, Wireshark, and a bunch of others. And so this gives you the capability to, as you see on the screenshot, go from our PCAP web interface where you can download a PCAP and we've automatically configured Network Miner to be the registered PCAP handler. And so you can open that PCAP up directly in Network Miner. You can then go to this files tab and it's going to automatically extract any files from that network traffic. And so when you think about that, it's almost kind of a magic act, right? Because you're, you're then taking, you're rewinding the videotape, right? You're taking your video camera, rewinding the videotape, but you're actually pulling out evidence from that videotape. You're actually reconstructing the scene of the crime and actually pulling out that real live malware from that network traffic. So that's kind of cool. Now let's talk about the power of community. Being a free and open source project, of course, community is very important to me. And it's very important that we integrate with as many different communities as possible. I mentioned before that we include the emerging threats rule set for network-based intrusion detection. And so that's a, a rule set of over 20,000 rules. And so there's lots of intelligence built into that rule set. There's lots of other defenders out there writing those rules and we get to benefit from their expertise and from their lessons learned. Same way with Wazoo, which as I mentioned before, is kind of the next generation fork of the OSEC host intrusion detection system. And it's got lots of rules that were kind of built on, again, this shared community expertise of what are the things that we're looking for across our endpoints and servers. 
In addition to that, we have Sigma rules. I mentioned that before, and that's a, another great community. And, and the, really the cool thing here is that Sigma is really kind of this generic abstraction layer of writing rules that can exist and can apply to multiple different backends. What does that actually mean? Well, you know, some enterprises are storing all their logs in Elasticsearch, like we are with Security Onion. Other enterprises are storing their logs in Splunk or something else. And so traditionally, we couldn't really benefit from the intelligence of those Splunk users. Uh, we couldn't really communicate with them. We couldn't really cross pollinate. We couldn't share ideas and detection concepts with them because we had different sort of backends. But Sigma changes all that because you can write Sigma rules that are generic and abstract, which then get converted to different backends. So you can convert your Sigma rules to run on an Elasticsearch backend. And that's exactly what we do in Security Onion. Next, we have YAR rules, and these are, are great rules when it comes to file analysis and looking for malware specifically. I mentioned before that we run Strelka, so whenever Zeek sees that you're transferring files across the network, it will take certain well-known file types like Windows EXEs and PDF files, extract those, run them through Strelka, which then processes them using these YAR rules, and now we've got additional intelligence running across all of those files that are transiting across our network. Next, we have Elastic Common Schema. And uh, this is another great way for us to integrate with the Elastic community at large, uh, because in years past, with all of these different Elasticsearch deployments out there, uh, some folks would define their data types one way, other folks would define their data types the other way. And it was really difficult then to be able to share visualizations and dashboards. And Elastic Common Schema really helps to resolve those differences because now we're defining a common schema so that this data type is defined uh, this way, this field is defined as this data type. And that really helps us to be able to share visualizations and dashboards and integrate with other tools and technologies. Finally, we have Community ID. And we're going to talk about this for a few minutes. And this is really cool because what this means is that we now have really kind of a common language to be able to correlate from a Suricata network-based IDS alert to a Zeek log, to a Sysmon log, to a firewall log. We'll actually see this over the next couple of slides. What this means practically for you as a defender is that you know, previously, if you started with an IDS alert, if you wanted to cast a wider net and look for that additional context, you may have had to run a manual query for, say, source IP and source port, and destination IP and destination port. And that gets old really, really fast when you're having to manually construct that query 100 times a day or 500 times a day or however often you're doing it. But community ID really takes all the dirty work out of that because now we've got a single field which enables us to correlate between all those different data types much, much faster than we could before. Again, it's that bicycle that's propelling us to go much further, much faster than we could in the past. So let's see what that looks like. Suricata includes native support for community ID and in Security Onion 2, we turn that on by default. So you can see this chart where on the left, these are our Suricata alerts. On the right, these are the community ID values for all of the different TCP streams where those alerts fired. Now, if we wanted to correlate those Suricata alerts to the corresponding Zeek logs, we could use that community ID value. And again, we see that Zeek has native support for community ID. And in Security Onion 2, we turn that on by default. And so here you see some network connections, source IP, destination IP, and how Zeek has automatically computed the community ID value so that we can correlate that backwards and forwards with our Suricata alerts. Now, in addition to that, we sponsored the development of community ID support in OS Query. We talked about OS Query before, how it's a great endpoint agent. 
And now this enables us to say, okay, if we found an interesting community ID, we can now run a query across all of our OS query endpoints and actually look for the process that generated that traffic. And that's a really amazing functionality to have, to be able to look at some network traffic and trace it all the way back to the particular process running on a particular host. And that's really gonna turbocharge your incident response process. But we can make it even better. Because what about tools where we can't easily add native community ID support? So OS Query was open source. So all we had to do was sponsor a developer to work on it. But for things like Sysmon, which we talked about before, it's a great free utility. However, it's not open source. They do have a GitHub repo, as you see here on the screen. And folks have requested that community ID be added to Sysmon. It's been accepted as a feature request and added to their backlog, but it simply hasn't been worked on and we don't have an ETA for it yet. So this is just one example of many, you know, another example might be firewalls where, you know, you might want to collect firewall logs from all the firewalls in your enterprise, but most firewalls don't natively support community ID. But we came up with a solution for that. So we sponsored the development of an Elasticsearch ingest processor for community ID. What that means is that any log that contains source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and the protocol, then we can automatically generate that community ID value on the fly. So you could send Sysmon logs to Security Onion 2, you could send firewall logs to Security Onion 2, and it's gonna automatically generate those community ID values on the fly. And that's tremendously powerful as we'll see in the demo in just a few minutes. So let's talk about some use cases. I'm gonna move fairly quickly through this so we can get into the live demo, which I know you're all itching to see. So our first use case is a small forensics VM. And this is kind of what we talked about really at the beginning of the talk in terms of, we want you to have uh, the quickest and easiest experience. If this is your first time running Security Onion, uh, just install a very minimal virtual machine. All you need is four gigabytes of RAM and you can install Security Onion 2, and you can do this small forensics VM. You can run a utility we have called SO Import PCAP. And so if you have an interesting PCAP that you want to import, you simply run SO Import PCAP and give it the full path to one or more PCAP files, and it will then import that. It'll run it across Suricata and Zeek and put it in a place where we can pivot the full packet capture. And it works really, really nicely. Moving from there, once you've kind of gotten your feet wet with Security Onion 2 and you want to actually put this into production, you might start with a standalone deployment. That's a sting, single standalone server box, which is running pretty much all of the components of Security Onion 2 inside of that one single standalone box. But now once you've kind of gotten comfortable with that, that might work for small networks, that might work for a small number of endpoints. But if you really want to be fully scalable for the enterprise, then you're going to be looking at a distributed deployment. This is where you would have a manager that manages your entire deployment. You've got one or more search nodes on the back end that's going to store all of your logs. And then you're going to have one or more forward nodes, and those are going to be your network sensors. And that's what's going to be generating the logs and sending them to those search nodes on the back end. We'll see a diagram of this in just a minute. So this small forensics VM, again, it's very minimal, uh, a minimal set of components that you see here in the diagram. Uh, contrast that with the standalone deployment, which has more components, meaning that it's a little bit more scalable, it's a little bit more flexible, a little bit more customizable, uh, and it's a little bit more kind of fault tolerant because it's got Redis built in as kind of a buffer. If a process kind of skips a beat for a little while, Redis can kind of queue logs up so we don't really miss anything there. So that's a little bit more stable and reliable for enterprise deployments, but again, it's only gonna work for kind of limited networks, limited number of endpoints, if you really want true enterprise 
scalability, you want this distributed deployment. And that's where we're going to have this manager that controls the entire grid. You're going to have your forward nodes, one or more of those, which are going to act as your network sensors, generating Zeek logs, sorry, Kata logs, uh, collecting syslog from your uh, remote syslog senders and sending all that through the manager to backend search nodes. And the brilliant thing about this design is that if you need to continue to grow it, you can simply snap in additional no nodes. So if you need more network visibility, you simply add more forward nodes up here. If that then starts to kind of fill up your existing search nodes down here, then you can simply snap in additional search nodes and they'll continue to load balance uh, all of the new logs that come in. So that's kind of our three main big deployment models to kind of give you a sense of uh, how you can get started with Security Onion and how you can really scale it up to large enterprise usage. Now, I mentioned before that we made some major announcements last Friday, and that includes this release of Security Onion 2, but we also made some other major announcements. So uh, any good open source project needs to have good documentation. We've spent a lot of time and effort making sure that we do have really good documentation. So that's available now. You can go to docs.securityonion.net and all of that documentation has been updated for the new Security Onion 2. Uh, I, I should mention that documentation is always a work in progress. So if you, if you notice anything is missing or incorrect there, just simply reach out to us and we'll get it corrected pretty quickly. To go along with that, uh, and as a part of that documentation, we have a handy dandy cheat sheet. So this is a nice desk reference that you can print out either front and back or two separate pages, however you wanna do it. And you can have it right there and it's got the main kind of commands that you would be running on a daily basis and kind of the main file system locations that you might need to be aware of uh, as you're kind of monitoring and administering your system. We also announced a new website. So, you know, and when you're, when you're dropping a, a brand new platform that's three years in the making, you take a look at everything that you do and you kind of redesign everything at once to include the platform, the logos, the website, all the marketing and everything. So you can find our new website at securityonion.net. We've spent a lot of time and effort, again, making sure it's, it's beautiful, but that it also provides the information that you need at your fingertips, whether that's about the free and open source project itself or about you know, some of the commercial products and services that we provide alongside that free and open source project. It's all right there at your fingertips. We've also got a new community support forum. Uh, so GitHub has this new thing called discussions, which is not even available to the entire public yet. Uh, we were fortunate enough to kind of get in on the private beta of that. And so we're now using that as our new community support forum. So we'll be moving away from our traditional Google group and away from our traditional subreddit, which we had for a number of years. And GitHub Discussions is where all of our new community support for Security Onion 2 will be held. And the nice thing about that is that it's right there in GitHub, right with the code, right with the issues, uh, and it's nicely and tightly integrated with the rest of our repo. So we made lots and lots of announcements last Friday, and that's just kind of a, a little hint of some of those things. Uh, if you'd like to see some of the other announcements that we made, you can catch the recording from last Friday, which we'll be publishing to YouTube at some point this week. All right, now it's time for that moment that you've all been waiting for. Uh, it's time for that live demo uh, to see if uh, the live demo actually succeeds or if it goes down in a blaze of glory. So we'll see how it goes, but let me kind of set the stage for this live demo. And we'll go back to that architecture diagram that we saw at the very beginning of this presentation. And that's the fact that we have an adversary out there on the big bad internet. We have a firewall. We have our internal network here with Security Onion monitoring that north-south traffic of all the traffic entering and leaving our network. And then we want to get some additional endpoint visibility from our endpoints here by collecting logs directly from that endpoint. So that's exactly what I've done. I've set up some virtual machines here on my laptop. I've got a Windows 10 endpoint, and I've also got a Security Onion 2 virtual machine. I've also got a PFSense firewall, 
and they're all connected together. So PFSense is sending all of its firewall logs to Security Onion. Security Onion is monitoring the network traffic here and the Windows 10 is sending its logs to Security Onion as well. So what we're gonna try to see is if we can see what it actually looks like to use all these new web interfaces, to slice and dice all these logs, to leverage community ID, to correlate all these different data types together to really make better sense of what's happening on our network. So without further ado, further ado here we go. Let me flip over to my VM here. And as you can see, this is our Security Onion 2 virtual machine. I'm running the optional analyst workstation. So I've got the additional kind of graphical tools built in. And so when you log into Security Onion console, you're going to see those tools, which, as I mentioned in the first half of this presentation, are built right into Security Onion console itself. And that's things like alerts and hunt and PCAP. And then we've got the external tools down here, things like Kibana, Grafana, and et cetera. And so let's kind of start with alerts because for many organizations, that's really gonna kind of be the starting point uh, where they kind of get their feet wet with Security Onion. And so we've got the Security Onion sensor, it's monitoring network traffic, it's collecting host-based logs, it's generating alerts. And so we start there at alerts we take a look at some of these alerts that we have. And so what you can see, if you look under event module, we have some logs coming from OSEC. That's our host-based intrusion detection system. We have some logs coming from Suricata, and that's our network-based intrusion detection system. These alerts are at different severities. And so some are low, some are medium, some are high. And so we could slice and dice according to event module or severity but let's just kind of pick and choose a couple of these and kind of think about the things that we might want to do as defenders when we're looking at our alerts. So for example, let's just kind of start with these first two at the top here. These are from OSEC and I know what these are. These are not that big of a deal. And so one of the things that you do when looking at alerts is triaging those alerts. And we talked about kind of managing that alerts queue, working that queue down to zero. And so if I know what these are and I'm not concerned about them, well, then I just need to go and acknowledge them. So if I click this first bell icon, it's going to remove it from that display. And I'll go ahead and do the second one as well. So now if I go and toggle the acknowledged slider, it's gonna show me those alerts that I just acknowledged. So I've started working that queue down by reviewing and triaging those alerts and acknowledging those things that I, I really don't care about. Now, if I turn that acknowledge slider off, I'm back to the main default view of all of those alerts that have not been reviewed yet and I need to start taking a look at. So now let's, let's start thinking about what else can we do from here? Uh, because uh, number one, when I'm looking at alerts, I need to do that triage process that I talked about. And in order to do that, I might need to get some additional context around that alert. So for example, let's, let's find an interesting alert here like this one. This is in the uh, emerging threats rule set. It's in the policy category and it's for outgoing basic auth, base64, HTTP, password detected, unencrypted. Now that's a mouthful. But essentially what that means is that there was some web traffic where there was some kind of credentials being sent using basic authentication, which means it's unencrypted. Uh, and so if these were sensitive credentials, well, that might be a security incident. We might need to engage the incident response process because now we've had some, some kind of exposure of our sensitive credentials. So, the next thing that we might want to do is we might ask the question, well, what were the credentials that were exposed? Because maybe I care about them, but maybe I don't. Maybe it's just some default credentials for some kind of device that I just don't even care about. And so I've got a couple of options here. If I want to kind of drill further into this, I can click on this and that brings up our quick action bar. And we can click this to drill down into the value and that gives us a little bit extra information here. 
We could click on this arrow to open up the log and see all of the fields within the log. And that gives us a little bit of extra information, including this network data decoded field, which shows us the HTTP GET request going to testmynids.org. And here's the authorization header for that HTTP transaction. And that's where we see that basic auth. And that's the data that was actually sent. And this is where we get into how all of these different web interfaces actually fit together and how we actually use them in conjunction with each other in order to go further and faster in that incident response process. So if I take and copy that and then maybe go over to CyberChef, what I can do is I can paste that into the input here and then I can slide over this from base 64 and you see immediately in this output root colon root. What that means is that base64 authentication was sending a username of root and a password of root. And so then it might be up to us to determine, okay, was this, was this an actual root account on one of our legitimate servers that we're concerned about? Or was this some Internet of Things device which just had some hard-coded credentials and it's a garbage device which we don't even care about, so we don't care about the credentials. But at least now we know that that device with that IP address is sending that username and that password. And so there you can see immediately the power of having this capability of going from an alert to CyberChef to be able to decode that kind of information. But let's take it a step further and let's say, well, you know, this network data decoded field really only shows us the HTTP GET request. Maybe I'm curious about what the web server actually responded with when it got these credentials. And so maybe I might use this item on our quick action bar to pivot to, over to our full packet capture. So now you can see we're on our PCAP page. And this is essentially, like we said before, rewinding the videotape and showing us that entire TCP stream from start to finish. This is kind of an overview that you might see maybe like in Wireshark, but if I turn on this view, that kind of collapses it down to a nice ASCII transcript, which is a little bit easier to read. And here I can see that GET request that we saw before in the network data decoded field. But in addition to that, I also see the web server's response, which is highlighted in red down here. So now I can actually see that entire TCP stream because I've rewound the videotape. Now, when I look at the web server's response, I see this page is just a placeholder, blah, 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 blah. And as it turns out, this was really just kind of some simulated malware that I ran on this Windows endpoint. And so this wasn't real malware. This wasn't a real security incident. Uh, but now we kind of have the confidence because we have that full packet capture and we were able to pivot to it very quickly and easily. But now let's, for the sake of argument, let's just say that that was more suspicious. Maybe we did decide to engage the incident response process. And so if we were to go back to this alert, what we might want to do is instead of acknowledging it like we did in the very beginning with those other examples, we might use this blue triangle to escalate that particular alert. So when I do that, it's going to remove the alert from this alerts queue because I've now done something with it. And so now if I go to the hive, that's our case management systems. Now, if I authenticate to the hive, I should have a case in here, and I had some cases from uh, some previous examples, but here's my new case for this outgoing basic auth base 64. And that took all of the information from that alert and started a new case in the high. So I can now start adding observables, indicators, I can add tasks to this. So if I, if I decided that this was malware and I wanted the help desk to go and re-image this particular workstation, I could put in a task for the help desk to do that and to ultimately document everything relating to this case so that then I could close that case. And if I ever needed to refer back to it, I had all my notes and all of my documentation in one place for that particular case. 
So that's really kind of the, the first example. And let's take a look at kind of another example, starting again with alerts. And so maybe I could look at uh, this alert here, which says, here's an emerging threats policy alert for a PDF with embedded file. And so maybe this time, maybe I might go and cast a wider net for that particular field. So if I hunt for this field, that's gonna take me from alerts over to hunt, and it's gonna hunt for this particular string, which is the title of that alert. Now, this is a, a more powerful interface. It has more knobs and, and things that we can tweak on it compared to that alerts interface, um, but we can also do more things with that. Uh, so again, if we wanted to sort of pivot to full packet capture, we could click on this icon here, and that's going to show me that ASCII transcript, and we can see that workstation doing a GET request for pdf.pdf, kind of an interesting name. Again, that's to test my nids.org. Again, I was kind of simulating malware there. And there we see the web server's response, application PDF, and there's the actual PDF file. But now if I wanted to go a step further and actually extract that PDF and maybe do some analysis of it, I could click this icon here, which is gonna download the PCAP file. And because we've registered Network Miner as the default PCAP handler, then when I click on that PCAP file, it automatically spawns Network Miner. I can go to the Files tab. It's already extracted that PDF for me. I can now right click and open folder and there is my PDF file. So I've now reconstructed that PDF, which you might you know, pretend is malware or something else suspicious or malicious. And I've now reconstructed that right out of that network traffic. Now I know that this is simulated malware, so I'm not concerned about it. So I can open this right up just to prove that this is actually a legitimate PDF and that it does open up because it was fully rendered from that PCAP file. So that's pretty powerful to have that kind of capability. Let me show you one more thing uh, when it comes to kind of starting with alerts. And we'll go back to this PDF with embedded file again. So if I drill down into that, uh, we talked about community ID and the ability to use that to correlate between different data types. What I might do is from this alerts view, I can, I can look into all of my different fields and I can find this community ID field. And when I find that value, I can click on that and then click the clear magnifying glass here. And that's gonna do a hunt for that particular value. And what you see there is that in the results, I get not only a Suricata alert, which is what I was just looking at, but I also get a Zeek connection log, a Zeek HTTP log, and also a PFSense firewall log. And so that's really the power of that correlation. That's the power of using that community ID value, because if I didn't have that, if I wanted to try to do this kind of correlation, I would have had to go up here to this query bar and I would have had to try to type in the source IP and then the source port and then the destination IP and then the destination port. And that takes a lot of time. It's certainly a whole lot slower than just being able to click on this community ID value and have it search for that. So that's really kind of the first big use case is uh, we are starting with some sort of an alert we're triaging that alert, we're investigating that alert, we're casting a wider net to figure out exactly what happened, we're painting a more complete picture, and ultimately deciding whether to acknowledge the alert or to escalate the alert. Now, the second big use case is really more of a threat hunting use case. Uh, and we've gotten to a place where sophisticated adversaries are smart enough to be able to evade our traditional IDS signatures, just like they've been evading our antivirus signatures for years and years and years. Now they're evading our network-based IDS signatures. And so it's important to be able to spend a good amount of time doing some arbitrary threat hunting. In other words, yes, alerts are important, but it's also important to go into hunt and just start doing some freeform hunting uh, apart from our alerts. And so 
we've got a lot of hunting queries built into hunt by default. If you just click this drop down box, we've got all these queries listed here to kind of start you on your hunting journey. And so, you know, one of the main protocols that's in use today, of course, is HTTP for the web. And we still see lots of malware and attacks using HTTP, even though it's clear text and it's, it's still out there and it's still, you're still able to catch attacks in clear text via HTTP. And so one of the things that, that I always recommend, it's always fun, you know, whenever we're working with a customer or, you know, consulting with folks in their environment, it's always fun to run this query right here, HTTP traffic grouped by user agent. And so this is going to go and take a look at all of our Zeek HTTP logs and then do a group by, which you may consider to be an aggregation or you may call it stacking, whatever you want to call it. It's essentially looking for the unique values in that data. Uh, if, you're, if you're an old school Unix and Linux command line junkie like I am, you know, you think about uh, grepping a log file and piping that into sort dash u uh, pipe it into or unique dash C or whatever the case may be and looking for those unique values, right? We're essentially doing the same thing here. By doing that, the most common user agents are going to bubble up to the top, right? You might expect to see the Google Chrome browser bubbling up to the top. Uh, we see here some kind of legitimate Microsoft user agents for crypto API. That's pretty standard stuff I expect to see in a Microsoft Windows network. But then when I look lower in the list, I see other user agents, which I don't expect to see, which I don't know off the top of my head what they actually represent. So things like Black Sun. And so if I were to drill into this, I could click on it and then click the plus magnifying glass. And that's gonna add that user agent to my query up here. Now I've filtered my entire hunt interface to just that one HTTP log that had that user agent in it. And so I've got my Zeek HTTP log. Again, I could drill into it and I could get the data that Zeek gave me in that HTTP log. But what if I wanted more data about that actual traffic itself? Uh, that's when we go back to this network community ID value. So if I click on that and click the clear magnifying glass, that starts a brand new query for just the community ID. And there we see we have not only our Zeek HTTP log that we were looking at previously, but also a Zeek con log. And so if I were to drill into that, I could look at my Zeek con log and things I get there are things like GeoIP lookup. So I can see uh, destination GeoIP information. I can also see source GeoIP information if it exists. And so that's lots of good context to have. If I want to kind of go back, I can do that. And then I can look at, well, I've also got a firewall log that correlates based on that community ID value. I've got a Suricata alert. So even though I didn't start with a Suricata alert for this particular use case, I'm actually able to correlate back to a Suricata alert. So let's, let's drill into that and see what Suricata has to say. So here we see an example of starting with threat hunting and we have this feeling that this user agent of Black Sun is suspicious because we've never heard of it before. And here we see that by pivoting based on community ID and doing this correlation, well, Suricata and the Emerging Threats rule set is actually confirming our suspicions. It's actually confirming that this is a suspicious user agent. And this is something that's been seen previously in network Trojan attacks. And so if I wanted to go even further, of course, I could pivot to full packet capture. And again, I could see the get request and the server's response, rewinding that videotape and reconstructing the scene of the crime. So that's kind of use case number two. So now let's move on to use case number three. And again, this is gonna be kind of more of a threat hunting kind of a thing, but instead of starting with our Zeek HTTP logs, now let's start with Sysmon because 
uh, in that previous example, we saw some sysmon logs. Let's actually start with sysmon logs for this one. So if I go to sysmon events, here we see I've got some process creation, I've got some process termination, and I've got some network connections. So let's click the plus sign for the network connections. And this is where things get really cool because having a Windows endpoint with Sysmon installed and collecting those Sysmon logs and bringing them back to Security Onion 2, I can actually group by network connection and then look at the executables that actually created those network connections. And notice that I have this process executable field and I can see that there's a lot of these that are showing me that this was curl running on a Windows box, which I don't really expect to see curl running on a Windows box normally. Uh, in this case, again, I was simulating malware. So I had the Windows subsystem for Linux installed on my Windows endpoint and that's where curl came from. But let's just pretend that we have all of these Sysmon network connection logs. And instead of 22 of these logs, maybe I had 2,200 or maybe 22,000 logs. And I really don't want to go one by one or page by page through all of those. What I'd like to be able to do is use the power of group buys and aggregation and stacking to be able to look for those unique values, to look for those statistical anomalies or those outliers, which might indicate suspicious activity. So in order to do that, what I can do is take this process executable field, click on it, and then click this icon, which is kind of the, the stacking icon or the aggregation icon. So when I do that, it's gonna group by process executable. So what I see is that even if I had 22,000 network connections, it would show me the unique number of those that were curl. And then it would show me a smaller number that were network connections initiated by dig, another utility that I don't normally expect to see on Windows. But let's drill into that uh, because that's the one with the smaller number and so let's just drill into that. And then maybe I might look at my destination IP. And again, I might use the power of group by to say, well, let's group by destination IP. And that's going to group it by up there. And I could select one of those. So you start to see this process of how we use threat hunting, how we're constantly kind of zooming in, finding something of value, and then maybe casting a wider net, pivoting to something else, zooming out constantly doing that zooming in, zooming out, stacking, aggregation kind of activity. And that's exactly what this hunt interface was designed to do. But now let's see, uh, if I were to take a look at this traffic, you know, this is dig traffic going to 8.8.8.8, .8 which is of course a Google DNS server. And so maybe I might want to, again, sort of pivot on community ID value, show me everything related to that community ID. And then maybe from there, I might say, well, let's pivot to full packet capture. And if I were to go to this view, what I would see is, you know, there's that full packet capture traffic. There's the actual DNS request going out to that Google DNS server. And so again, being able to leverage all those different data types and correlate them together using community ID. So now let's look at our, our very last case study and we'll do this quickly as we're starting to run out of time here. Uh, for this one, let's start with a firewall log. So again, most firewalls are not capable of generating community ID values. So I've got a PFSense firewall and I'm sending all those firewall logs over here to Security Onion 2. And so we've got a query built into Hunt that takes those firewall logs and groups by action, which is gonna be either, does the firewall allow the traffic to pass or does it block it? So maybe I drill into the pass. And then again, let's pretend that there's thousands or 10,000 or 100,000 logs here. And we don't want to go one by one or page by page. So maybe we group by the source IP field. And that gives me the unique values. It shows me there's 4,000 connections for this IP address. And there's only 149 connections for this IP address. So maybe I drill into this. 
And then maybe I group by destination IP. And again, that shows me the unique values for that destination IP. Maybe I find an interesting IP here and drill into that. And once I've done that, maybe I group by destination port. You start to see this iterative process of, again, kind of zooming in and zooming out and zooming in and zooming out and working our way down to something that's of interest. Again, I see some port 80 traffic, which you know might be rather expected. Most web traffic is port 80. But now I see also one connection that was port 22. An attacker might be using that as uh, command and control. It might be using that for data exfiltration, maybe doing some SCP over port 22. So maybe we might want to drill into that. Maybe we might want to then pivot to full packet capture. And actually, let me go back and do this a different way because we can pivot on community ID and we can see not only the firewall log itself, but also a Zeek con log. So again, using that community ID value for correlation, I can pivot to full packet capture. There I can see the actual traffic itself because we've rewound the videotape. And just like in Wireshark, you see we've got a SIN flag, we've got a SIN flag, but there's no full TCP three-way handshake. So that kind of gives us a better sense of there really wasn't any data that was transferred here. There wasn't much that actually transpired in this TCP connection. All we had was a couple of uh, SIN packets that went out. So uh, at this point, we are, uh, we're pretty much out of time for the demo, but uh, what we saw here was several different kind of use cases of starting from different data types and correlating between those different data types using community ID, being able to pivot to full packet capture, being able to escalate alerts and create cases out of them, being able to uh, acknowledge alerts if they are things that don't mean anything to us. And so you start to see how all of these different interfaces really kind of work together to build that better bicycle to help you to go further and faster than you could have otherwise. So at this point, I'll kind of wrap up and turn it over to our moderator to see if we have any questions uh, from our audience. Thanks, Doug. So we do have one question that came in. For standalone product deployment, could SO v2 be deployed on a small single board computer like a Raspberry Pi, Odroid, or Arduino? A-R-D-I-N-O, sorry. Yeah. So uh, I to present the upper management? Yeah, very good, very good question. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Raspberry Pis myself and I have, uh, you know, a whole drawer full of them literally. Uh, and Raspberry Pis are cool. The problem with Raspberry Pi is it's just not quite enough horsepower to do the kind of network analysis that we are trying to do. And so we don't compile our software for ARM processors. Uh, we only compile for Intel AMD 64-bit architecture. But what that means is uh, there is an Atomic Pi out there that's not an official Raspberry Pi, but it does run uh, Intel architecture. You can kind of run that. It's still very, very limited, and it's still very limited, especially when it comes to RAM. Um, there are other single board computers out there that run an actual Intel processor, and they have enough RAM to be able to do the kind of things that we're doing. Uh, and so you can get uh, small form factor PCs if you're looking to do this like on a home network or another really small like lab network or, um, you know, just a, a minimal network, maybe at work. It can work well for those kind of things. Uh, the, the best, most detailed information is going to be on the hardware requirements page on our documentation. So, so just go to securityonion.net slash docs and then you'll see a hardware requirements page. And it'll walk you through all of those requirements from the processor architecture to the RAM to disk to all of that information that you need to spec out the hardware. Great answer. So Doug, again, I can't say thank you enough for giving this workshop today here at All Things Open. Um, I know I personally learned a lot and I love the fact that you put your social connect down there. I'm sure a lot more people will be having questions to follow up with you on. So guys, if you're out there, and you can see the slide, Doug's put up his social 
um, networks as to where you can find them. So at Doug Burks or at Security Onion.